So, part two of the development of carriers. At this point it's probably worth noting that we're going to be following the development of the fleet carrier in its various guises in this little series, largely on the grounds that once you start including light carriers, escort carriers, seaplane carriers, maintenance carriers and such, like you'd end up talking for about three or four hours on any particular era that you care to vaguely define, even in what is necessarily a relatively brief summary. And so we'll pick up those other types of carrier at some point in the future. For the moment, however, you might ask, how am I defining fleet carriers for the purposes of this and subsequent videos? Well, I've chosen to go with the following. They must have been designed as a carrier from the keel up, since we're past the era of big conversions, unless, of course, it was a nation's first attempt at a carrier. It must have been capable of around 30 knots or more, give or take a knot, and it must have been designed to carry at least 36 aircraft, i.e. three squadrons at least if you're using a 12 aircraft squadron. Thus, in this and later videos, we won't be talking about ships like the Zuiho class, HMS Unicorn, or the Independence class, although the Saipans will appear in episode three, whenever we get around to that. But as said, these other vessels will show up in other videos at some point, and of course, this is about carrier history and development, not so much about their combat record, unless that happens to cover some particular point relating to the design or use of the ship. So we're going to go through the various carriers by nation, in order by which the nation laid down their first carrier of this period, since unlike the previous video, there are some rather clear lines of development in play. This means we start with the Imperial Japanese Navy, and more specifically the carrier Ryujo, aka the Great Loophole Exploiter. Prior to her construction, a flurry of dedicated carrier designs had been circulated both within Japanese circles and elsewhere, but in the 1920s these had mostly been iterations on designs like Hermes or Hosho, which meant 10 to 15,000 ton displacement designs for the most part and which in turn meant that they'd count towards the displacement limit for carriers under the Washington Naval Treaty in a period when everyone was trying to work out what the best use of carriers actually was. Plus, with the big conversions about to start sailing around, the idea of a much smaller vessel wasn't all that appealing, and so these went nowhere. But by the end of the 1920s, Japan was confident enough in its carrier operational doctrine that they were looking to expand their carrier fleet, and they thought they'd found a way to do so whilst retaining their Washington Treaty displacement allowance for bigger ships later on. You see that in said treaty, a carrier was defined as a ship displacing over 10,000 tonnes and designed for carrying aircraft. Given that the first dedicated carriers, Hermes and Hosho, were just below or around this limit, and it was logically felt that as aircraft size and performance increased, any new fleet carrier would have to be larger in order to be useful. But the Japanese decided to see if they could get a useful aircraft carrier out of less than this, using all the weight-saving techniques and creative accounting that they'd developed in their cruiser and destroyer lines. Whilst the resulting ship would be nowhere near as capable as Akagi or Kaga, it wouldn't matter so much as long as it had a useful flight group and they could build as many as they liked. To be on the safe side, and also to make the design cheaper and thus more easily buildable in mass numbers, Ruggio was designed to displace 8,000 tonnes or so at standard displacement, foregoing any semblance of protection on a hull that sat somewhere between Hosho and Hermes in terms of overall dimensions, as well as lacking an island. This was all in order to carry initially 24 aircraft and attain a speed of around 29 knots. Now this was a bit shy of what a ship like Akagi could do, but with Kaga in the fleet, it was an acceptable top speed for the Japanese Navy, since Kaga was fractionally slower still. With work starting in 1929, partway during construction, it was decided that she should instead carry 48 aircraft, and so an entire other hangar deck was added. And so when she emerged, it appeared that the Japanese Navy had a real winner on its hands, a fast carrier that could operate an air group larger than some ships more than double her displacement, and more than half of that of ships four times her displacement. Two of this new type would offer more redundancy and more aircraft than even the giant Lexington class carriers, whilst also needing fewer men to crew them. But all of this was brought to a crashing halt by two major developments, 
Firstly, the London Naval Treaty of 1930 closed off the loophole that Rougeau was exploiting with a number of clarifications. Specifically, Article 3, Section 1. For the purposes of the Washington Treaty, the definition of an aircraft carrier given in Chapter 2, Part 4 of the said treaty is hereby replaced by the following definition. The expression aircraft carrier includes any surface vessel of war, whatever its displacement, designed for the specific and exclusive purpose of carrying aircraft, and so constructed that aircraft can be launched therefrom and landed thereon. Then Article 4, Section 1. No aircraft carrier of 10,000 tonnes, or 10,160 metric tonnes, or less dis standard displacement mounting a gun above 6.1 inch calibre, shall be acquired or constructed by or for any of the high contracting parties. Section 2. As from the coming into force of the present treaty in respect to all the high contracting parties, no aircraft carrier of 10,000 metric tonnes or less Standard displacement, mounting a gun above 6.1 inches, 155 millimetres, calibre shall be constructed within the jurisdiction of any high contracting parties. The undertone of this means you, Japan, could scarcely have been clearer if it was written in the margins in capitalised red ink. This brought an immediate halt to plans to build more of this type of carrier, which was coupled with ongoing reports of stability issues in the ship, which weren't helped by the entire additional hangar deck which had not featured in the original design. With the Tomozuru and Fourth Fleet incidents in the early 1930s, the ship was hauled back into dock for additional strengthening and other measures to try and keep her upright. The initial measures taken after the first incident proved rather fortuitous as she was present during the latter incident, and even with the initial changes she was damaged and suffered flooding in the hangar. Without the first modifications she may well have suffered a considerably worse fate. Additional modifications were then undertaken, remodelling and raising the bow amongst other things. As a result her overall standard displacement rose above 10,000 tonnes anyway. So even if the loophole hadn't been closed, she wouldn't have been a practical long-term loophole exploiter in any case. She would have proved useful as a testing ship, as well as her normal duties, with many aircraft that would enter Japanese Navy service debuting for trials aboard her during the 1930s, as well as demonstrating a number of new tactics including the use of the then new dive bomber. She would also demonstrate one of the larger problems with her general concept. Although able to operate 48 aircraft when she entered service, the increase in size and capability of naval aircraft over the 1930s saw her overall capacity drop quite quickly, with many later aircraft even unable to use the ship's rear elevator. Nonetheless, she did buy the Japanese Navy valuable experience, setting them up for their next attempt at a first proper fleet carrier, Soryu. Whilst Soryu and Hiryu are often mentioned together, and sometimes grouped into the same class, there are some substantial differences between the two ships. They were supposed to have been the same, having both been authorised under the same naval programme in the early 1930s, but Soryu was laid down in 1934, which meant that while she used many of the lessons from Ryujio, her design was finalised before the two major incidents mentioned earlier, and so she was quite lightly built, with a relatively narrow profile and minimal armour protection, well, anywhere. She was consequently a surprisingly light vessel, clocking in at barely over 16,000 tonnes standard load, but using what was effectively a Megami-class cruiser's power plant, she was able to hit over 34 knots with two hangars that gave her an as-designed air group of well over 60 aircraft, not including spares. This again compared very well with older carriers, more than trebling the air group of the first purpose-built carriers for just under double the displacement, whilst being considerably faster, and having 70-80% to 80 of the air group of the various large conversions, which were in turn almost double her own displacement. But, as with Rougeau, the exciting figures hid a number of flaws. The upper hangar was low, and the ship's length-to-breadth ratio was so fine that the island had to be stuck out on a protrusion to starboard in order to keep the flight deck clear. 
and of course the ship was very lightly built. Some minor corrections could be made post-construction in light of the Tomoruzu and Fourth Fleet incidents, but fundamental issues like the narrowness of the hull could not be corrected. Hiryu, in contrast, was laid down a couple of years later in 1936, and thus changes were made to her design before work was started. As a result, she would be around 2,000 tons heavier than Soryu, with a wider beam, and would actually carry some meaningful protection. Additional work to the bow made her more seaworthy, and the hull overall was constructed significantly stronger. The island was also placed further back along the hull, and could be brought in slightly compared to Soryu thanks to the overall greater width. As the Japanese Navy's plans called for carriers to operate in pairs, Hiryu also had a near unique feature that had thus far only been otherwise seen on Akagi. The island was on the port side of the ship. Uh, this feature ended up not working out especially well and would not be repeated. Overall, these first three purpose-built carriers would serve well enough, although Ruggio would see her air group and her operational strike pass package drop her out of frontline duty in the Kido Butai for many operations, and Hiryu and Soryu would end up feeling the pinch of the sacrifices in protection that they'd made when both of them were hit at midway by three bombs apiece. Albeit thousand pound weapons they'd not anticipated, even in the more protected draft designs, and they ended up being sunk. Rougeau succumbing to a similar barrage of bombs, with a torpedo thrown in for good measure some time later. The Imperial Japanese Navy now possessed four full fleet carriers, plus Rougeau, and with a variety of lessons learned, it was now in a position to order its first class of fleet carrier that would actually be made up of similar ships, the Shikaku class. With Hiryu laid down in 1936, the same year as Japan withdrew from the naval treaty system, the Shikakus could be laid down without the concerns about treaty limits on available displacements and the like, and although ordered only the next year, the ships were a huge step change. The Japanese Navy wanted a carrier that combined the best of all their previous ships, the significant defensive firepower of the refitted Kaga, the sheer carrying capacity of Akagi, and the speed of Soryu and Hiryu, as well as better armour and better operational range compared to any carrier, either current or projected, in Japanese, American or British service. Thus, the new ship's displacement would be almost double the amount of water that Soryu had displaced, clocking in at just under 30,000 tonnes standard displacement, making them the largest dedicated fleet carrier design of the pre-war period. And they would also incorporate much more advanced damage control and a comprehensive torpedo defence system when compared to previous designs. One major issue, however, was only changed at the last minute. Initially, the ships were actually designed with a portside island located about halfway along the ship. The idea was to help balance the ship, as the weight of the island would offset the weight of the exhausts on the starboard side, and also increase the overall amount of open space that was available on the forward part of the flight deck for takeoffs, it being thought that about half the deck length was enough for landings. The latter was the more important of the two factors, but the exhausts were in the way of a starboard side island at that desired location, and forcing a port side alignment had the happy benefit of the aforementioned balancing effect. But whilst Shokaku was in advanced stages of construction, experiments on Akagi and reports from both it and initially trials from Hiryu began to indicate that a port side island was not such a good idea which, coupled with an increasing realisation that newer and heavier aircraft would need longer landing areas, compelled the relocation of the island to the starboard side about one-third of the way along the ship from the bow. Whilst Zuikaku, having been started later, could have this change implemented more easily, on Shokaku, a partial sponson for the bridge on the port side had already been built, and so, whilst her island was also moved to this new starboard position, she would still have this small sponson left in place as a little visual indicator of which ship was which in the class. <laughs> 
other innovations included a small bulbous bow to assist with high-speed running, although various sources do argue over if it was one, the other, or both ships that were fitted with this. Albeit that from available photos and the balance of sources, I'm inclined to go with both in this case, as Shikaku definitely had this innovation, as can be seen from dockyard photos, and it would seem a bit strange that Zuikaku, the second ship in the class, would somehow not be fitted with it. The ship's hangars were enclosed, in keeping with Japanese design principles, although the walls were lightly built and largely there for keeping the sea out rather than anything more aggressive, some thought being given to the idea of these sections failing under pressure to blow out in the event of a catastrophic event in the hangar, thus mitigating the effects of any significant explosion. Despite their greater size, the ships could still make over 34 knots, thanks to a truly monstrous power plant, and they were designed to carry 72 active and 24 reserve aircraft, albeit that by the time they entered service, newer and larger aircraft, a constant bane of interwar carrier designs, meant that whilst 72 active aircraft were retained, the number of reserve airframes had dropped to 12. Large, Fast, well protected, and with a large air group, the Shikakus represented exceptionally powerful aircraft carriers for their time, albeit the massive displacement did help, with some argument being possible that, at least at the time of commissioning, they were the most powerful carriers in the world, albeit that technological advances occurring with great rapidity at the end of the 1930s and start of the 1940s, particularly in the anti-aircraft department, would exacerbate some of the ship's weaknesses, or indeed create new ones. All of the purpose-built Japanese carriers of the interwar period would carry a defensive battery of 127mm dual-purpose guns, backed up by batteries of the more questionable 25mm gun in a variety of mounts, Occasional machine guns would make an appearance, but were generally useful only for using tracer rounds to show the other guns where the enemy was coming from. The Japanese Navy's next carrier project was authorised in 1939, but would only have work started in 1941, and thus falls outside the scope of this video, that carrier of course being Taiho. The US Navy meanwhile faced a double challenge. Japan, and indeed Britain, had at least designed one ship from the ground up as a carrier each already, whilst each of the three carrier hulls in US service were conversions. So not only was the US Navy trying to expand its carrier fleet, but it was also trying to actually build a purpose-built carrier hull for the first time. Still, Langley provided valuable lessons to draw on, at least in terms of hangar arrangements and flight operations, whilst Lexington and Saratoga were still completing but there was an additional complicating factor. The US Navy was still complying with the naval treaty requirements, and it made sense to have similar carriers filling up the remaining displacement allowance, which added up to 69,000 tonnes when measured in long tonnes, the preferred measure of the treaty system. This would allow for either a class of three 23,000 tonne ships, four at just over 17,000 tonnes apiece, or five of just under 14,000 tonnes. A series of tabletop scale war games the US Navy undertook to help develop tactics and strategy indicated that a carrier found was a carrier sunk, and so it would be better to have many smaller carriers so that some hulls would still be left after any given strike. Additionally, within the sizes of ship dictated by the suggested displacements, you'd be able to actually carry more aircraft overall with five smaller carriers, assuming some design compromises, than three larger ones. This would start a persistent on-again, off-again relationship between the US Navy and smaller fleet carrier hulls, although preliminary design work in the early 1920s considered designs with standard displacements ranging from 11,000 all the way up to 27,000 tonnes, the Washington Treaty upper limit, in an effort to derive roughly what increases and decreases in displacement would cause a carrier to gain or lose in terms of capability. In the middle of all this came a rather surprising clash of priorities. The war games predicted that a carrier would need to operate dive and torpedo bombers, the former being a relatively new idea. However, dive bombing demonstrations from USS Langley seemed so impressive that it would eventually be decided, as an economy measure, fair enough, that the new ship should only carry dive bombers and fighters. 
and so no provision would be made for torpedo storage or torpedo bombers. In some ways this actually had slight advantages, since the dive bomber was a much smaller and lighter aircraft compared to a torpedo bomber, and so you could fit more of them into a given hangar space. But, as this would turn out in the later 1920s, estimates of dive bomb effectiveness were somewhat overblown at this point, and this design decision would hamper the ship in future roles. Additionally, again because only Langley was really available to provide lessons, the new carrier would be designed without an island, and thus the exhaust from the engines would have to be trunked away separately. It was only as the big conversions came into service that the advantages of an island became apparent, and so one was hastily added to the ship whilst it was under construction, resulting in a somewhat odd hybrid that had trunked exhaust and an island instead of an integrated island and funnel. This would also increase the ship's overall weight, taking up more room on the limited tonnage that the US Navy had available. The designers also at some point had to be dragged kicking and screaming away from equipping the ship with a pair of triple 8-inch gun turrets, as the weight penalties on a ship of this size were far too great in order to allow it to maintain a useful air group. Still, the US Navy had concluded that Ideally, they'd want a maximum size carrier, that is, one built up to the 27,000 tonne limit of the treaties, uh, with variant designs being a so-called soft carrier, with a flush deck, lots of aircraft and fairly minimal defensive equipment, as compared to a slower, more heavily armed vessel with fewer aircraft and more guns. At the other end was also some attempt to, at a 10,000 ton minus an ounce design to exploit the same loophole that Ruggio had, but the US Navy couldn't find a design that allowed for their projected weights and sizes of future aircraft that would actually work, and so with the extremes defined, work settled back on the three displacement multiples mentioned earlier. Eventually, as the 1920s drew to a close, the USS Ranger would have its design finalised. Although she wouldn't be ordered until 1930 and not laid down until 1931, she incorporated a number of features unique to as-designed US Navy carriers of the time. An open hangar deck allowed aircraft to be warmed up before being taken up to the flight deck. There was provision for cross-deck catapults, although in the end they wouldn't actually be installed to save on costs and displacement. And she had the ability to operate as a carrier in reverse as well as moving forward. Due to being a carrier from the start of the design process, and thanks to the move toward open hangars, Ranger actually had more hangar space than the Lexingtons, as well as enough hangar height to carry a substantial number of disassembled aircraft suspended from the ceiling. In theory, she could carry 76 aircraft, the same as Lexington, on half the displacement. All of this came with a small battery of 5-inch 25 caliber anti-aircraft guns and a substantial battery of 50 caliber machine guns, as well as plans to introduce the new 1.1-inch cannon, which was primarily designed to deal with dive bombers. So what was not to like? Well, there were compromises. The arcs of fire for the anti-aircraft guns weren't ideal, and the anti-aircraft battery would subsequently be moved around quite considerably over her lifetime. She was also not as fast as the US Navy wanted. Whilst able to hit just over 29 knots on a good day, this compared poorly with the fast Lexingtons, and the Ranger's smaller size meant that she also lost speed a lot faster as the seas built and wind levels increased in poorer weather, resulting in a more practical speed limit of 28 knots in most cases. Protection was also next to non-existent, with nothing in the way of a torpedo defence system and minimal other armour, barely enough to protect her from smaller destroyer guns. Her shorter overall flight deck and some questionable choices of elevator placement as a result of trying to accommodate the ultimately not fitted cross-deck catapults meant that her speed of air operations was also somewhat reduced. These issues became fairly rapidly apparent in the 1930s, and as a result she would be restricted to low threat environments during World War II. With more experience from Lexington and Saratoga available, and the first evaluations of Rangers potential, the US Navy was left with enough tonnage for two or three more hulls. At the top end, they could build a couple of 27,000 tonne carriers, hence the work earlier or they could build three 18,500 tonne carriers. Four repeat rangers were very quickly ruled out. This had obviously been the lowest tonnage level. A final option was also considered, 
two carriers that came in at just under 21,000 tonnes, along with a repeat of Ranger. The decision was quite difficult. The US Navy wanted to remedy many of the flaws in Ranger's design, which the larger carriers offered more opportunity for. But they also wanted more hulls, and like the Japanese Navy, they believed that paired carrier operations were a good idea. Whilst some improvements could be made on an 18,500 tonne hull, this didn't offer too much room for upgrades and would leave the US Navy with a pair of large carriers, three medium carriers, and Ranger. Eventually, the decision was made to go with a compromise solution. Repeat the Ranger, which would at least in theory be cheaper and have some utility, whilst two 20,800 ton hulls offered a reasonable scope for improvements in design, such as reintroducing the torpedo bomber, actually having a torpedo defence system, going for higher speed, more protection and additional anti-aircraft guns, as well as the idea of having two flying off decks, or more accurately, the ability for some lighter aircraft, such as fighters, to take off directly from the hangar, as well as normal operations from the flight deck. Almost immediately there was a debate as to what form the increased levels of protection should take. Torpedo defence was a given, but some felt that a carrier which was planned to be used in the raiding of enemy supply lines and the like should carry a strong anti-surface armament and commensurate belt armour protection. Others felt that other carriers would be the main threat and so deck protection and AA firepower should be prioritised. It was thought that one bomb hit should impair a carrier's operations and two would knock it out of operational tasks completely, with war games and fleet problem exercises suggesting that whilst a carrier was not yet the decisive weapon, the ability to control the skies, scout and nibble away at the enemy's fleet would be a major advantage, resulting in many exercises having both sides go after the other's carrier first in order to achieve the requisite air superiority. There was some serious thought given to implementing an armoured flight deck, but with the other requirements associated with a large air group that formed the basis of US Navy carrier thinking at the time, it was decided that it was not possible to fit this on a carrier at this displacement without too much compromise in other areas. The man who tried to fit a couple of triple eight inch guns to the Ranger had clearly escaped his containment once again, as one of the various schemes put forward during the design process, Scheme J, was larger than called for, only carried 65 aircraft, had a flight deck that was only two thirds the length of the hull, but offered very heavy armour protection and a full heavy cruiser battery of three triple eight inch gun turrets forward but fortunately it would be the immediately preceding proposal, Scheme I, that went on to form the basis of the Yorktown class. Theoretically, this 20,000 ton design would have protection against 6 inch gunfire and the ability to carry 90 aircraft, albeit that the way aircraft numbers were calculated showed some variation depending on the type of aircraft carried and could run over the practical limits of deck operations. Theoretically, Ranger could carry 108 aircraft if you used only fighters and fully stacked both the hangar and the deck, despite her more, more normal complement at the time being around 70. Likewise, the capacity of the Lexington class was 70, 90 or 110 aircraft, depending on which measure you used. The main restriction was that if you added more aircraft on the deck, you couldn't recover aircraft, as the landing area would be taken up. In one exercise, an air group of 82 operational aircraft aboard Lexington was reduced to 52 the next day after issues in managing them all were experienced. The reason that Scheme I was now 20,000 tonnes instead of 20,700 tonnes was that it had been realised that a two-level flight deck, armouring for the main flight deck, and a well-protected hangar and ship wouldn't all fit in this displacement. So, by shaving off about 700 tonnes and allocating it from both ships to the third smaller ship, it was hoped that two of the features could be retained anyway, but the third vessel could use the combined extra 1400 tonnes to incorporate some additional features that were lacking in Ranger. The smaller carrier would lose out on to the torpedo defence system and would have a theoretical air group about 20 less than the 20,000 ton vessels, with the feature being dropped being the armoured flight deck on both. <laughs> 
In part, this was to retain a high hangar, and in part because whilst all navies were using dive bombers with approximately 500 pound bombs, the US Navy was also looking at aircraft carrying 1,000 pound bombs, which posed much greater issues when it came to allocating sufficient deck armour to stop them. There was a brief flurry of activity, once these designs had been locked in, that re-examined the idea of either 6 or 8 inch guns, in which sanity fortunately prevailed and it was pointed out that such armament could not be fitted to a carrier with a useful air group, as defined by the US Navy standards, without massively enlarging the ship and thus losing the third smaller carrier entirely. It was also found that the torpedo defence system didn't actually cover the part of the ship most likely to be hit by torpedoes, and so hull volume had to be reallocated from the ends of the ship to the centre to allow for a deep enough torpedo defence system to be installed. It still wasn't especially good, and the non-alternating nature of the boiler and engine rooms doubled down on that weakness, but with weight piling up higher and higher in the ship as a result of increasing levels of anti-aircraft armament and heavier and heavier aircraft, it was left as it was, something that Hornet would come to regret later in life. Fortunately, this round of economies to pay for weight increases elsewhere didn't eliminate torpedo storage again, although it had been suggested. The flight deck was however extended to accommodate high performance aircraft and catapults were included at both flight and hangar deck levels. Improving over the Ranger, the ships would use the new dual-purpose 5-inch 38 caliber gun instead of the anti-aircraft only 5-inch 25 caliber gun. Unlike Ranger, the Yorktowns would have an island and funnel as designed, although the air officers mounted a spirited attempt to keep the carrier flush decked until almost the last design revision. Whilst Yorktown and Enterprise would be laid down in 1934, and design work would move on first to WASP and then the non-treaty restricted Essex class, the pressure of war clouds gathering on the horizon would cause a third ship, Hornet, to be laid down in 1939. Whilst the compromises in Yorktown's design were known, it was simply far quicker to build another of the class than try anything else, and with just over 32 knots of speed, the US Navy knew that all three ships of the Yorktown class would be interoperable with the Lexingtons. Overall, the Yorktowns represented very good carriers for their displacement, and despite the concerns over their torpedo defence system, they would actually prove remarkably tough when it came to taking hits in this area. The two main weaknesses of the design being the non-alternating machinery and the lack of substantial protection from dive bombing assaults, the latter of which contributed to the loss of Yorktown and the repeated visits of Enterprise to the dockyards. Most of these issues were however known to some extent at the time of launch and were more forced upon the class by the need to comply with treaty weight restrictions than any particular failure of the design staff themselves. As we've said, they had actually designed 27,000 ton carriers that mitigated many of these concerns. That, of course, leaves WASP, which suffered from many of the same issues as the Yorktowns during the design phase limits on displacement, and the fact that whilst an extensive body of experience from the operation of the Lexingtons was now available, by the time her design was finalised and keel laid down in 1936, none of the purpose-built carriers were as yet in service, so some features introduced in Ranger and the Yorktowns were still considered unproven at this point. Whilst her displacement was much closer to Ranger than Yorktown or Enterprise, in many ways, WASP would be scaled down from the latter rather than scaled up from the former, in part due to the Yorktown's more advanced design and in part because it was recognised that there were a number of features in Ranger the designers specifically wanted to avoid, such as the flush deck with hastily installed island. The overriding desire was to maintain armament, both in terms of aircraft and guns, at almost all other costs, which resulted in the Wasp having the same defensive weapons as the Yorktowns, a mixture of 5-inch 38, 1.1-inch and 50 calibre guns. With this locked in, a number of other options were considered, considering the effects on air group of different levels of speed and armour. Fitting the same levels of armour and torpedo defence as the Yorktowns practically halved the air group and sent speed plummeting to an entirely unacceptable 25 knots. Ramping the speed up to 32 knots meant no protection and the same restrictions on air group. 
an attempt to have partial armor protection and a torpedo defense system left an air group in the mid-60s, but also cut speed to the mid-20s to stay on the approximate 14,000 ton target displacement. An air group of 72 was possible, with defensive firepower as specified in a speed of just over 29 knots, which would at least allow it to keep up with Ranger, uh, but only at the expense of having no torpedo defense and minimal armor elsewhere. And that air group was only possible with the Ranger-like elimination of torpedoes and torpedo bombers from the design. Although, as it turned out, Wasp would later operate Avengers anyway. With all that said, Wasp did have a number of innovative features. Her machinery was partially distributed, uh, making her much more survivable than her larger predecessors, uh, providing damage was limited to flooding. She also introduced the deck edge elevator, and was built with a non-symmetric hull, which allowed the ship to balance the offset load of the island and funnel without the need for deadweight ballast. Unfortunately, her stability was almost undone by something that was nothing to do with ship design. Her air group. The overall weight of more modern aircraft, meaning that the overall weight of her projected four squadrons, was more than double what the initial design estimates had suggested, which in turn meant that she could carry no reserve aircraft, lest this additional weight high up in the ship result in an HMS Captain moment. It turned out that Wasp could actually make almost 31 knots, at least on trial, and thanks to a number of small but critical improvements to engine technology that took place while she was being designed and built, but was small enough to be added to the ship without any radical redesign, albeit that at speed at sea remained at around about 30 knots. In the end, her lack of protection, similar to that of Ranger, would lead to her loss when torpedo strikes ruptured gasoline storage tanks, but again, as with the Yorktowns, these weaknesses were known factors at the time of launch, and introduced because of treaty weight limits rather than oversight on the part of the designers. With the end of the treaty system, the next carrier class to be built would be the Essexes, which basically included almost everything that they'd have to leave out of the Yorktowns, with the exception of the armoured flight deck, plus new technology, and lessons of course developed on both the interwar carriers since the, their construction. But since the Essexes fall into the World War II period, we'll leave them for another video. There is, however, one more thing to mention about USN carriers before we move on. In 1938, when Congress authorised another 40,000 tonnes of carriers, which would eventually lead to Hornet and eventually Essex, there was a strong push in the US Navy towards more numerous light carriers for sea control again, four hulls of about 10,000 tonnes instead of two larger ones. Admiral Gormley described the case for these as follows. The United States has a fleet strength sufficient to obtain essential command in the Atlantic against any opponent, save England, and to obtain command in the Eastern Pacific, or to dispute command in the Western Pacific. Whatever the situation, the problem of exercising command of the sea will be a difficult one. Our superior strength may force, and probably will cause the other fellow, to spread out. We must be ready to spread out to get him. Opposed by Germany, or Italy, or both, our problem is to interrupt their trade routes while giving economical but effective protection to our own. The same holds for the Pacific. When we consider the problem of running down Emden's, which was US Navy shorthand for armed surface raiders, we immediately recognise the advantage or necessity of covering an extended area with a widespread mobile-based air scouting force supported by gunpower adequate to the need. The current US conception of a carrier has centred largely on one capable of carrying 72 planes, with gunpower, speed, protection, etc. modified to fit into a limiting global tonnage. The tactics involved in the employment of our large carrier may be summarised as follows. It requires about 30 minutes to launch all planes, and requires about 60 minutes to take aboard all planes. Must head into the wind for a period of about 30 minutes to launch planes, and carrier catapults may modify this somewhat. Must head into the wind for a period of about 60 minutes to take aboard all planes. Vulnerable to attack due to large number of planes dependent on one flight deck. Vulnerability causes carrier to be normally kept removed from probable enemy proximity. This causes deadhead flying and adds to the difficulty of coordinating air operations with those of other forces. When separated from major surface units, large carriers normally require cruiser and destroyer protection. 
the large carrier carries a mix of types of planes, fighters, bombers, torpedo bombers, and scout bombers. The large carrier subordinates gun power to air power. It concentrates on air striking power. Generally speaking, the area that could be patrolled effectively or searched by a carrier with 72 planes exceeds very little that which can be searched by a carrier of 36 planes. If it were found necessary to patrol an area 500 miles by 1200 miles, it could be done better with three small carriers carrying a reduced number of planes than with two large carriers. If large carriers only were available, three would be used for the task just the same. For scouting, we need numbers of carriers in order to spread them out. We need to reduce their vulnerability as regards the number of planes put out of action by a damaged flight deck or by underwater damage. We need some increased gun power in order to reduce their dependence on close and constant cruiser protection. We can reduce the number of planes per carrier and improve the efficiency of search operations for a given number of planes by making the primary function of these planes scouting. They should be able to carry bombs and have sufficient maneuverability and gun equipment to act in the capacity of fighters, but the primary requisite is scouting. 18 to 24 of such planes will provide a very efficient unit for this purpose. A carrier constructed for the general purpose of operating with cruisers in exercising control of sea areas will fill other functions or needs also. For lack of a proper designation, it is called a scouting carrier. U.S. Navy veterans or historians of the U.S. Navy may recognize the genesis of the arguments for the sea control ship in that particular set of arguments, and if you really want to sleep badly at night, you can imagine if this had gone through, perhaps a U.S. Navy equipped with a large number of very small ships armed with what were effectively U.S. Navy versions of the skewer. And once you've all stopped screaming, we can continue with the video. This particular position would lead to the preparation of first a 10,000 ton and then a 15,000 ton design, but ongoing concerns about the utility and survivability of Ranger and Wasp in any kind of actual hostile environment would lead to these being rejected as fleet weapons. Albeit that some other work would be referenced when it came to designing the wartime independence class light carriers, which were of course converted from cruiser hulls. And so we come to the Royal Navy, who'd held off longer than the other two major powers, in part because they had a lot more holes to play with when it came to gaining carrier experience. Japan had Hosho, Akagi, and Kaga. The US Navy had Langley, Lexington, and Saratoga. Whilst the Royal Navy had Hermes, Argus, Eagle, Furious, and later Courageous and Glorious, reflecting a wide range of design choices and options, and giving plenty of food for thought when it came to designing new purpose-built hulls. Quite a number of these were also operational considerably earlier than Lexington, Saratoga, Akagi, and Karga. That it also allowed the Royal Navy to ride out the worst of the Great Depression without having to pay for new carriers was also something of a deliberate semi-political choice. Times of conflict would also play their own part. Whilst Japan would end up gaining a fair amount of useful carrier combat experience in the late 1930s during one of its perennial wars with China, this came after the bulk of the Japanese Navy's interwar carrier fleet was either built or under construction, and so really provided operational experience as opposed to design experience for their interwar carrier fleet. The US Navy had to make do with tabletop and extensive real-life war games. But with the British Empire at hand, as well as a somewhat less isolationist view as compared to its two main competitors, this meant that between the early use of HMS Vindictive in the Baltic and various long-term foreign stations such as the ongoing pirate hunting operations by HMS Hermes and HMS Eagle on the China Station, and complex multi-carrier exercises in the Mediterranean fleet, the Royal Navy came into the 1930s with a considerable degree of carrier operational experience. They were, however, faced with some rather starkly different operational environments. Both Japan and the USA could largely, albeit not entirely, build their ships with a view to Pacific operations against each other. But in both cases, with their home ports on one side of the ocean and most or all of their fleet to hand. The Royal Navy, on the other hand, had to consider Pacific operations with only frontline bases and only a portion of the fleet to hand as well as operations in the North Sea, Atlantic and Mediterranean and elsewhere, most of which would face considerable opposition from land-based aircraft. 
and something that, outside of a few flying boats, no one especially considered as an issue when it came to the Pacific, since at the time nobody outside of Japan knew about the extremely long-range capabilities of a number of Japanese strike aircraft then under development, and the Japanese themselves, correctly, believed that nobody else had aircraft to match them in this particular role. This left the Royal Navy considering a number of options, but by the early 1930s, conflict with Japan seemed by far the most likely, and so a fleet carrier would have to be effectively a self-contained and survivable mobile island far away from easy resupply or repair. This in turn called for a large air group, but also called for a ship that could avoid damage as much as possible, all stuffed into a hull that would fit the newer requirements of the then upcoming Second London Naval Treaty, which had trimmed maximum carrier displacement down from 27,000 to 23,000 tonnes. The carrier would also have to fit into the smaller dry docks that were available overseas, as coming back halfway across the planet any time any major damage was incurred would have been entirely unacceptable, and may indeed have led to the loss of a ship. Various ideas to this effect had been circulating within the Royal Navy and being refined through the 1920s and early 1930s, with some attempts to try and build such a vessel in the late 1920s having been curtailed by the Great Depression. And so when money matched need, there was a solid basis of designs to work from. The overall result of all of this was the development of HMS Ark Royal, with a theoretical air group of 72, utilising a double enclosed hangar that resulted in a vessel with a colossal freeboard. But she differed from earlier designs in a number of ways. Significant was the lack of dedicated anti-surface weaponry, something that had featured all the way back along the design lineage so far. Instead, the ship fairly bristled with anti-aircraft guns, at least for the time period, carrying twice the heavy anti-aircraft battery of a Yorktown, and comparable to the much larger Shikakus, with 16 4.5-inch guns in eight twin mounts, along with a fairly heavy battery of medium anti-aircraft and machine guns. For all its faults, the two-pounder pom-poms were, at 40mm, by far the heaviest medium anti-aircraft guns fitted to an interwar carrier, albeit that the competition was the 1.1-inch and 25mm guns, and they were quite numerous by barrel count as well. Protection against surface threats was limited to passive defensives only, armour and a torpedo defence system, plus whatever the 4.5-inch guns might throw an attacker's way. And of course, a hope that speed would allow the ship to stay ahead of pursuit long enough for either escorts or the carrier's own aircraft to slow down the annoyance. A deck park with a single hangar was considered, but the double hangar was preferred on the grounds of making air operations easier since it meant that the flight deck could be kept entirely clear if needed, and it was also considered that the operational conditions in some of the seas that the Royal Navy habitually sailed in would probably see deck parked aircraft rapidly becoming expensive, if somewhat interesting, homes for fish in very short order. Due to the constraints of displacement limits and the stacked nature of the double hangars, Ark Royal would not have as much height per hangar as compared to the single hangar US Navy carriers, but at 16 feet there was decent clearance for aircraft on each of the decks, just not enough space for suspended spare aircraft, something that would see the air group size reduce as larger and more modern aircraft came into service, and whilst the deck park remained resolutely ruled out as an option, the displacement limits also ruled out an armoured flight deck and led to the use of extensive amounts of welding instead of riveting in order to save weight. The desire for relatively heavy side protection, as well as enclosing the hangars, also left them somewhat narrower and thus more cramped than other designs, as space between the hull plating and the hangar was occupied by these protective measures. Also found occupying these spaces were the extensive damage control prevention and handling equipment that was fitted, with this having become something of an obsession in the Royal Navy after the loss in World War I of one of their earliest carriers, the wonderfully named Ben Maishri, to an aircraft fuel fire. As a result of the need to fit the smaller dry docks, the hull was much shorter at the waterline than at the flight deck level a full 118 feet being added to overall length by the time this flight deck level was reached, some 66 feet above the waterline. For some idea of scale, Ark Royal's flight deck actually sat almost 10 feet higher above the water than a modern nuclear-powered supercarrier's flight deck does. <laughs> 
Although designed for around 30 knots, she would prove capable of 31 knots at a push when on trials. As with every carrier in this video except the Shikakus, there had to be compromise somewhere due to treaty displacement restrictions, and in Ark Royal this was primarily found in the machinery spaces, which was significantly less subdivided than was standard practice. This made keeping the ship running much easier, as the almost cathedral-like lower decks were easier to move around in, but would eventually prove to be her Achilles heel when she was hit by torpedoes in World War II, with the large spaces proving to be fatal flooding risks. Another factor to account for is that with the expectation of long-term operations and a very long, long distance to resupply, a good portion of Ark Royal's hangar space was set aside for an extensive maintenance workshop and its attendance resources. This was designed to allow the ship to repair and rebuild a damaged aircraft that came back from various missions, prolonging their operational lifespan. Something that the US and Japanese navies largely addressed by allocating a number of spare airframes to their carriers with a much smaller machinery shop. This choice was driven in part by the reaction of the Royal Navy to the advent of newer and faster aircraft, which differed somewhat from the reaction but from other navies. Before the invention of radar, it was thought that these newer and faster aircraft could almost certainly reach the carrier before any fighters beyond the combat air patrol could be launched. The Japanese and US navies both believed in a fairly quick massive strike to overwhelm their enemy, with a second attack on the enemy fleet in general assuming that the carrier survived this first exchange of blows. The Japanese believed that survival was best achieved through hitting the enemy further away than they could hit back, and then falling back on a mix of speed, combat air patrol and anti-aircraft guns in case that didn't work. The US Navy put its faith more on simply hitting the enemy hard and fast and first. And whilst combat air patrol and anti-aircraft guns were present, it was perhaps the most accepting of the three big navies to the possibility of losing a carrier, at least as an operational unit if not actually sunk, as a direct result of an enemy strike or counter-strike. The Royal Navy on the other hand was looking at much longer term operations, with the air group designed to be kept going for multiple strikes over weeks, along with a carrier that would survive partially through combat air patrol and evasion, but mostly through being mean enough and tough enough a target that an enemy strike would be unlikely to score hits in the first place, hence the preponderance of anti-aircraft weaponry. With all that said, the Ark Royal was designed with an unusually heavy strike roll in mind. Despite a slightly smaller air group than other dedicated and smaller fleet carriers such as Soryu or Yorktown, Ark Royal's air group was heavily weighted towards torpedo bombers, which also served as scouting aircraft, a role taken up by the dive bombers on US ships, and dedicated scouting aircraft on other ships in the Japanese Navy by this time period, with the balance being made up almost wholly of dive bombers fighters being a relatively small component of her overall air group, the ostensible dual use of aircraft like the skewer notwithstanding. And this also perhaps explains the overall slightly smaller air group since of course the torpedo bomber takes up more space. Also seeing a debut aboard the ship and a factor in its design was the capacity for night operations, something the Royal Navy had obsessed over ever since Jutland. In the pre-radar days, this was part of the reason for fleet air arm aircraft to always have a second seat, to help with navigation, and also in part why fighter complements were so small. At night, they'd be largely unneeded, and so during the day they could largely help to guard the fleet. To this end, the ships carried a homing beacon with a rather clever feature. It rotated once per minute on a very tight beam. Aircrew would sync their watches with it before taking off, so that when they received the beam briefly on their equipment, by comparing the blip to the position of the second hand on their watch at the time of receipt, they would automatically get a bearing back to the ship. For example, if a radio man received the signal at 30 seconds past the minute, then the beacon was pointing south at that point, and he would therefore have to turn reciprocally north in order to find the ship. With all that said, by the time Ark Royal was under construction, the increasing threat from fast strike aircraft, combined with exercises showing that perhaps anti-aircraft fire wasn't quite as lethal as everybody had hoped, plus the rising threats in Europe, saw a much higher likelihood of having to fight in range of significant land-based air cover, 
and this all added up to a need to change tack in design. Even the Pacific was a new environment, with both the US Navy and Japanese Navy now building larger carriers with significant air groups, the sheer number of aircraft a Royal Navy carrier was likely to meet up with had gone up dramatically. Without any way to detect or break up incoming strikes in time, again pre-radar, as well as a desire to have the carriers operate quite closely with a fast fleet, which may then result in them coming under a certain amount of direct fire, it seemed to Admiral Henderson, then in charge of overall acquiring new ships for the Royal Navy, that the next carriers would have to be far, far tougher to survive the inevitable incoming strikes. This led to the next set of carriers becoming the illustrious class. But it wasn't just the threat from enemy air power, it was also a role consideration. As we've seen with the Ark Royal, the Royal Navy was thinking of carrier operations somewhat differently to the Japanese and US navies already, and the illustrious class were also influenced by this thinking. With the Royal Navy already having a number of hulls similar in role profile, if not air group, to the Ark Royal, namely Furious, Courageous and Glorious, these could provide a more general air defence and strike power to the fleet. But with the European war, all the potential adversaries had significantly smaller navies than the British, and so would be likely to shelter their own forces in harbour until they deemed circumstances favourable to them, sitting under the cover of land-based air power and trying to whittle away the Royal Navy by attrition. Starting way back with plans for a mass aerial assault with torpedo bombers on the high seas fleet if World War I had lasted longer, the Royal Navy thus planned to strike the enemy fleet in harbour with carrier-based aircraft with the intention of either drawing them out for battle with the Royal Navy's battle line, or just flat out sinking or badly damaging them where they sat, in either case eliminating the enemy fleet from the equation. But in the 1930s, several things were clear. No sane amount of carriers would be able to contest the skies over Wilhelmshaven or Taranto by day, and any attempt to launch an assault at night, using the necessarily heavier and smaller naval strike aircraft, would leave the responsible vessels at a significant risk of counter-strike by longer-ranged land-based aircraft, both on the way in and more especially on the way out. With the Royal Navy heavily investing in night operations, the numerical superiority issue was less of a problem, but the risk of overwhelming counter-assault was even higher in this mission profile, and so protection had to take an absolute priority. Thus, the class was designed with an armoured box that formed the hangar, leading to what was for a carrier heavy armour plate on the sides, necessitating an enclosed hangar, along with an armoured roof that formed a good portion of the flight deck and also covered the machinery and magazine spaces. This was designed to work on two levels. Against the more typically expected bombs of around 500 pounds, the armoured flight deck would resist these weapons outright, meaning little to no damage would be incurred and any minor issues could be rapidly set to rights. Against larger weapons, 1,000, 1,500 and 2,000 pound bombs, the significant resistance of the armour would serve to initiate the bomb's fuse upon impact which would then lead to the bomb detonating shortly thereafter relatively high in the ship. Whilst this would destroy aircraft and damage the hangar, the extensive damage control measures and compartmentalisation of this space should, in theory, save some of the air group and allow the ship as a whole to survive, whereas without this protection such a weapon would no doubt punch deep into the ship before exploding, likely dealing far more fatal damage to the magazines, the underwater hull, or the engines. Additionally, if these heavier weapons were released at lower altitudes, or if they came in at an angle, the armoured flight deck should provide relatively good protection when it came to deflecting their attacks as well. This in turn would keep the carrier either operational, or at least repairable, maintaining the Royal Navy's carrier force over the course of what may prove to be a long-term conflict. And in all but the worst circumstances, it would ensure that the air group itself was also kept intact. This would then allow its reuse in multiple engagements, since a strike on a moored enemy fleet would either need follow-up strikes later on, or else, if the enemy fleet emerged, the carrier's aircraft would be needed to keep hitting them, as well as to defend the Royal Navy's fleet. Thus, the thinking went, if the protection allowed the air group to survive one or more enemy airstrikes, then the lesser number of aircraft that having the armour would require were an acceptable trade-off, since it would be better to hit an enemy half a dozen times with three dozen aircraft at a time than once with six dozen aircraft and then have the carrier knocked out or destroyed.
On the 23,000 ton displacement limit, however, this would mean more compromises than just the air group, which would end up hovering at around the mid-30s without the use of a deck park. Also gone would be the extensive repair and maintenance workshop found aboard Ark Royal, which would in turn drive the development of another kind of supporting carrier that's best covered separately. Anti-aircraft armament remained strong, but hangar space had to reduce as the ship itself became smaller in order to allow for sufficient armour over the necessary area with the given displacement limitations. And this in turn meant that the hangar would have less floor space and less head height than hangars on ships of comparable displacements or dimensions in the US and Japanese navies. And between low numbers and a very offensively minded role, the overall balance of aircraft carried was the most weighted to offence by percentage of any of the carriers of the period. Their construction only starting in 1937 did however mean integration of radar during the fitting out stage, which would allow more effective use of the necessarily very small fighter complement than, than would otherwise have been the case. The fourth ship, Indomitable, was altered to have a partial double hangar, as the pace of naval aircraft development was already beginning to indicate that a carrier with a small complement might be reduced to useless by the arrival of larger aircraft. This increased her carrying capacity without a deck park by a squadron to 48 aircraft, although by the time she got into service she would actually end up carrying far more fighter aircraft than strike craft as the course of the war at sea had shifted substantially by the time she entered full operational service. There was, as with the US Navy, some talk in the late 1930s of a series of small carriers in the 10 to 12,000 tonne range, but the designs produced showed a cost of around 60% that of an illustrious for one third the air group, low speed, and very limited survivability. So the idea was very rapidly dropped. Of all the major classes of interwar carriers, the illustrious class would be the only ones to come out the other side of World War II without suffering a hull loss although not for lack of trying, by the enemy, which in many ways validated the toughness built into the design. But the low hangars that had been a necessary compromise of armouring the ships on the limited displacement available meant that their post-war careers were limited by an inability to operate the newer and ever larger aircraft, and so they would spend the following decade or so largely as second line and training vessels, albeit that they were the only pre-war carriers to have any major role in the post-war environment. None of the Japanese Navy's pre-war fleet carriers survived the war, and of the US Navy's force, the three survivors, Saratoga, Ranger and Enterprise, were nuked, scrapped, and then put in reserve and later scrapped, despite efforts to preserve her, respectively, the last of which remains one of the greatest injustices when it comes to ship preservation. There were two more fleet carrier types which would be laid down during the interwar period, although neither would see service as neither were completed, the German Graf Zeppelin and the French Joffre classes. But since they were never completed, they will have their own separate videos. And that rounds out the development of fleet carriers in the interwar period. World War II would see Taiho, Essex, Implacable and others take to the field, whilst still other efforts such as Seydlitz, Aquila and so on and to a certain extent Shinano, would never quite come to fruition. But those ships, as well as more details of how the interwar carrier fleet would fare in the trials of combat, will be for another time. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.